Lord God, we have sung of your power to save. We rejoice in that power. And Lord God, now we declare your ability, even your willingness to speak to us and instruct us through your word. Teach us, Lord, we pray, that the church might be built and that you might be glorified. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. On October 31st of this year, it'll be exactly 500 years since a Roman Catholic monk named Martin Luther published a document entitled Disputation on the Power of Indulgences and mailed a copy to his archbishop. That document is better known as the 95 Theses because in it, Luther listed out kind of in bullet point form 95 affirmations and concerns he had with the church at the time. Legend has it that he nailed uh, this document to the door in Wittenberg, Germany, although historians aren't really sure if that happened. According to Catholic teaching at the time, when Christians died, they went to a place called purgatory, where they suffered for years, maybe even centuries or millennia, until they had all their remaining sin purged away. And the church was teaching that you could purchase your way out of years of purgatory by buying notes called indulgences. You could also purchase these to buy the way out of purgatory for people that you loved who had already died. And this was a part of an entire system of obtaining favor before God by doing certain acts that the church told you to do and by giving money to the church of Rome. And Luther saw that this system bypassed the need for God's grace. It also bypassed the need for true repentance because, of course, if I can purchase my way out of years of punishment, I don't ever actually have to truly repent, right? Luther's main point in his disputation was this. You can't buy God's grace. There is a need for true repentance, and the church needed to clean up her act. Now, at the time, Luther was still very thoroughly Catholic, and, and actually... He was a, a monk and a professor of Catholic theology. He posted these theses believing that the church just merely needed to clean itself up a little bit. And he actually thought that most thinking, faithful Catholics would agree with him, including the Pope. But as it turned out, the 95 theses end up being the opening shot in a war that resulted in an entire cultural and theological shift in history, probably the biggest one since the time of Jesus Christ himself. So this was the beginning in earnest of the Protestant Reformation. And every Protestant church, including this one, can trace our origins in some way, shape, or form under the providence of God to Luther's actions at the end of October 1517 along with a number of other reformers, John Calvin, Holdrick Zwingli, a number of other men. Out of the Protestant Reformation, among other things, has come a set of doctrinal commitments that are said to reflect the teaching and the beliefs of all the reformers. They're known as the five solas of the Reformation. The five solas, the, the word sola being the Latin word meaning alone or lo, uh, only. These are doctrinal commitments that have set all Protestants apart from the Roman Catholic Church. Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, the glory of God alone. I want to talk about these five solas this morning, but my purpose isn't to give you a history lesson. I, I am a history buff. Many of you are not and would find that extremely boring, okay? That's not my purpose this morning. It isn't to heap praise on the reformers. As a matter of fact, 
uh, we would find very significant differences that we have with many of the reformers. They were fallen men like us. It isn't to beat up on the Roman Catholic Church or any other church for that matter. My purpose today is to explain these, these doctrinal commitments that have come out of the Reformation, uh, of which we are heirs. I want to uh, demonstrate briefly how they reflect biblical truth, and then I want to convince you that they are important for us today. Okay, that's my purpose. The Church of Jesus Christ, including this church, is never out of the woods of the danger of losing the gospel. It is always a danger for every church in every era to lose our grip on the gospel. And I think these truths, if, if, to the degree we, we grip them and understand them and hold on to them is the, the degree to which we're, we'll cling to the biblical gospel. So let's start. I think you have in your notes five, uh, uh, a five-point outline there the word alone in each one. The first one is Scripture alone. The Latin sola scriptura, Scripture alone. What this means is that the Bible alone is our final standard in deciding what is true and right. The Bible always has the last word. Sola scriptura was a bedrock principle of the, of the Reformation. But it's interesting, it didn't start that way. For example, when Luther posted his 95 Theses, he was still thoroughly and completely Catholic. And he wouldn't have signed off on any of the five solas this morning. He wouldn't have agreed with any of them at the time. He saw some abuses in the church and wrote up a document confronting those abuses. But then he was surprised when the, when the entire church, including the Pope, opposed what he thought was the right way to do things and the biblical way to do things. And so Luther found himself having to decide, was man authority, was the church authority, were church officials authority, or was God's word authority? And of course he landed where many past people who had been considered heretics landed, and that is in the position that scripture alone was our final authority. And once Luther made the move to embrace Scripture as his sole and final authority, that opened up everything else for him. That opened it, uh, everything to be reformed by him. And a few years later, Luther stood before the emperor, the Roman emperor, at the Deed of Worms. He was being asked to recant everything he had written and everything he had taught. He had the threat of banishment from the kingdom and possibly burning at the stake and this is what he said I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the Word of God I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against my conscience I cannot do otherwise here I stand may God help me amen for Luther, Scripture was the only sure foundation for belief. And Scripture testifies the same thing, right? 2 Timothy 3, all Scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There's only one written document on earth that can claim to have been breathed out by God himself, and that is the Bible. It's the only text that comes from God himself. The Apostle Peter, quoting Isaiah, writes, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. You and I, every church leader who's ever lived, the elder board of this church, the pastors in this church, our grass, and we will fade. The word of the Lord endures forever. Man's opinions change. You know this. Things that are considered right today 
two decades ago were considered wicked. Two years ago were considered wicked, right? Man's opinions change. As Christians, our beliefs have to be anchored to something, and the only something that is firm is God's word. The final authority in determining right and wrong, truth and error for Christians is Scripture and Scripture alone, not the opinions of men, not the opinions of the pastors and elders of this church. Sola Scriptura. The second sola to examine is sola gratia, grace alone, grace alone. The Roman church taught that it was possible by doing acts of penance and the sacraments of the church to earn merit, to earn good standing before God. The reformers taught that any good standing we had with God was due entirely to his grace, not to any merit on our part. As a matter of fact, how do we define grace? unmerited favor, right? Unmerited. According to Reformation theology, our righteous standing before God is imputed to us. It is granted to us. It is counted to us because of the work of Jesus Christ. Rather than a gospel of self-accomplishment, self-merit, the Reformers taught, taught the doctrine of sola gratia, that salvation is from beginning to end a gift of the grace of God. We don't have a, in us the capacity to achieve the righteousness that the law of God demands. God's righteousness is an absolute righteousness. We, we can't do any better than that tax collector in Luke 18, right? The parable of Luke 18 who beat on his breast and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. As Luther said, sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are attractive. And this is, of course, exactly what Scripture teaches. I'd invite you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're in a few different places in Scripture today, but we'll be spending quite a bit of time in Ephesians 1 and 2. Ephesians 1... Verse 3. Where does the credit go? Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he's blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Look at chapter 2. Here you were. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Where does the credit go for your salvation? Why does God save? Because we deserve it? Because we figured it out? Because we chose him? What can dead men do? You were dead. Dead men do nothing. We need the grace of God to move in us because we would never move toward him on our own. There have been periods throughout church history where the church has 
clouded the biblical teaching on grace. And this is one of the things the reformers sought to recover. And we need to make sure that we don't lose what was recovered by the blood and the sweat of men and women a few hundred years ago. Our understanding of grace is so important because the human heart always wants to take credit for where we, where we are. We, we always want to feel like we deserve something good, right? C- can I just say to you this morning, you have never met anyone yet who thinks he is as bad as he is. You have never met anyone yet who thinks she is as bad as she really is. You and I don't think we are as bad as we really are. The reformers sought to bring us back to an accurate reflection of, an accurate picture of human depravity. They knew people didn't just need cleaned up. We don't need just a little grace to make us able to then be holy enough that God will one day accept us. People need to be reborn. Dropping a few coins in a cup or repeating a few prayers, doing any number of good deeds or religious rituals don't make us acceptable to God. Being here this morning hasn't made you acceptable to God. We're all evil to the core. We're in desperate need of God's grace. You know, we have a saying, and I've used it. You've probably used it. We see someone who's sort of like really caught up in those sort of really bad sins or really hitting on hard times and there but for the grace of God go I, right? I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've ever said that or thought it. Some of you are raising your hands anyway. Okay. There is some truth to that. But you know who that sounds a whole lot like? Sounds a whole lot like the tax collector in Luke 18 who said, God, I I thank you. It's due to your grace, Lord, that I'm not like this wicked tax collector here. Sounds a whole lot like, like the Pharisee. Recognizing God's grace goes beyond merely realizing God has kept you from some really bad stuff. It's realizing that you have gotten into some really bad stuff because you are made of some really bad stuff. You are corrupt. We are corrupt to the very core of our being, and yet God in Christ has set his love upon us and called us to himself and set us free from the terror of his wrath. That is the gospel of God's grace. You didn't come in here this morning clean enough to take communion. You didn't didn't pray enough this morning to come in and take communion. You didn't confess enough sins to come in here and and celebrate the Lord's table. I, I hope you prayed this morning, and I hope you've confessed sin. But you didn't do it enough to be worthy of taking from the Lord's table. And yet God has invited you to feast with the Lord Jesus Christ out of his grace and his mercy. We sang it. John Newton did not write, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that kept me from being a wretch. It's not what he wrote. He didn't write, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We read it earlier. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. We must never lose the biblical truth of grace Alone, or we'll trade away the gospel of Jesus Christ for something else, which is not a gospel. It is not a good news if it isn't of grace. And by the way, we'll know 
We're holding on to the biblical truth of God's grace, not merely by what we profess with our lips, but by how we treat one another. If there's grace in this congregation, it's because we have seen and experienced the grace of God and salvation. Number three, faith alone. Faith alone. Sola fide. Sola fide was actually, you could say, the main truth of the Reformation. Justification by faith alone. This is where the fight was. The central cry of the Reformers was, we are justified by faith. Luther called justification by faith the summary of all Christian doctrine. And the doctrine by which the church stands or falls, justification by faith alone, which was heresy to the Roman church. It taught a theology that involved earning merit before God. At the time, salvation was the Lord giving you the grace to become holy, and then you living out that holiness in order to one day be holy enough to achieve heaven after burning off the rest of your sinfulness in purgatory. And the Reformation view of justification was instant justification on the basis of faith alone. The Genevan Confession of 1536, which was authored uh, primarily by John Calvin, said, We confess that the entrance which we have to the great treasures and riches of the goodness of God that is granted to us is by faith, inasmuch as, in certain confidence and assurance of heart, we believe in the promises of the gospel and receive Jesus Christ as he is offered to us by the Father and described to us by the word of God. So we've already stated that we're saved by God's grace, but how does great grace operate? Grace operates through faith. The reformers recaptured the biblical truth that salvation is not by works that we perform. Not by Bible reading or church attendance or even by praying a prayer. We're saved by grace through faith and faith alone. You're there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where we left off. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And Paul uses that same argument in other places. Galatians chapter 3, he gives us, a, as an example, Abraham asking the question, when was Abraham made right with God? When was Abraham justified? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And all who believe in Christ are sons and daughters of Abraham. All other religions involve some form of self-effort, self-salvation. Pray this many times, facing this direction, make this pilgrimage, avoid eating this, go through this ritual, whatever it is, and you'll be right with God. And the truth is, none of these things bring peace with God. When have you done enough? When have you prayed enough? When have you confessed enough? How do you know when you've done enough good works? You can never have a clean conscience when you're relying on your works. Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. The only way to have peace with God is to be declared righteous before him on the basis of faith. Now, what justification by faith doesn't mean is that faith and works are antithetical to each other. It doesn't mean we'll be saved without having any works. As the saying goes, we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Look at Ephesians 2.10, the very next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. True faith produces works. True faith produces works holiness of life. This was James' point in James chapter 2. You say you have faith, but you don't have any sort of life that backs it up. What kind of faith is that? James 2 says, that's the faith of demons who believe and they tremble, right? Demons believe the truth. They know the gospel, but they refuse to submit to Christ. John Calvin said, wherever, therefore, that righteousness of faith, which we maintain to be gratuitous, 
So that righteousness that we receive by faith, purely by grace, it's gratuitous. Wherever that is, there too Christ is. And where Christ is, there is the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit who regenerates the soul to newness of life. True faith produces a life. So what does sola fide mean? What does faith alone mean? It means that we're saved by faith. And that saving faith will produce good works in us, but we don't rely on those works. We don't rely on those works. We rely on Jesus Christ. Which brings us to our fourth sola this morning. Number four, Christ alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. It's by Christ's work alone that we're saved. The Reformation called the church back to Christ as the sole mediator between God and man. The Roman church prayed to saints, invoked Mary, venerated relics, all as a means to secure release from purgatory. You could perform various rituals in order to try to persuade dead saints to ask God to get a loved one out of purgatory more quickly. And the reformers taught that salvation was by Christ's work alone. Not the work of Mary or the saints or the Pope or anyone else. Salvation by Christ alone. Listen to John Calvin again. Christ stepped in, took the punishment upon himself, and bore the judgment due to sinners. With his own blood he expiated the sins which made them the enemies of God and thereby satisfied him. We look to Christ alone for divine favor and fatherly love. You're there in Ephesians. Turn a couple, uh, a couple books to the right. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 13. And I want you just to hear what Paul is saying about Jesus Christ and why Jesus Christ is our focal point. 113, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. It's all about him. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2. Christ reveals God to us and reconciles us to God. And the only way to know God is to know Christ. At the beginning of the third century, there was a Roman emperor named Severus. And Severus was seeing that there were a lot more Christians in the Roman Empire at the time. People were, more, more people were becoming Christians. And so to placate some Christians, he decided to add Jesus to the pantheon of gods that were acceptable to the Roman Empire. He was thinking, of course, that he was doing the Christians a favor. And he was surprised to find that the Christians not only weren't happy, they were actually angry. They were angry that the emperor would put the one Lord in a pantheon of pagan gods. Because they believed, and we believe, Christ isn't one of many gods. He stands alone as the one Savior of men's souls in the one way, the only way we can be made right with God. So in the old Roman Empire, there was the temptation for Christians to give in to the pressure to put Christ alongside pagan gods. In the Reformation, there was a 
temptation. There was pressure to put Christ alongside Mary and the saints and the Pope. And today, there's pressure for you and I to tone down our proclamation that Christ alone is Lord, right? That he's superior to Muhammad, he's superior to Buddha, he's the only way of salvation. That idea, if you haven't noticed, is considered to be bigotry to the world. It's called hate speech today. But the reformers taught, and scripture teaches, that's in Christ alone our hope is found. He is our light, our strength, our song. Or as Jesus put it, no one comes to the Father except through me. By the way, solus Christus, Christ alone, for Luther, was intimately tied to sola scriptura. As Luther came to his understanding of scripture as being the last and final word, he saw the Bible not merely as an inspired document, but an inspired document that preached Christ from beginning to end. He saw Jesus Christ all throughout the scripture. One of the things we haven't inherited from the reformers and ought not to lose is that the whole point of the Bible from beginning to end is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. There's a lot of things in scripture. We're taught about creation and, and origins and, and morality and end times and all of those things in scripture and they are all important. We must hold on to all of them. But we have been given a gift. And that is to see that all of Scripture proclaims Jesus Christ. It's in Christ alone that we can come to know and be known by the Almighty God. 2 Corinthians 4, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Which leads us to our final sola, number five, to the glory of God alone. The glory of God alone. Soli Deo Gloria. All glory belongs to God alone. God's glory and not human improvement is the central motivation for salvation. God is not a means to an end. He is the means and the end. All of life is to be lived for God's glory. It's said that J.S. Bach, who was a, a strong Christian, he would write SDG on the bottom of every uh, musical composition. When he completed it and was satisfied in it, SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God. And that was the great aim of the reformers, to lift up the glory of God, which had been covered over and obscured by traditions and rituals and false teaching. If you are interested at all in, in reading a, a little bit more about the Reformation, Michael Reeves has written a, a little book called The Unquenchable Flame. And if you're going to read something, read, read that because it's a very engaging, even humorous at times. And he talks about the Reformation. But I want to quote uh, from Michael Reeves. In the Reformation mindset, salvation is a gift of God's grace alone, found not in any pope or mass, but in Christ alone and received by simple faith alone. And we can know this for certain only through Scripture. Only if all these things are true, the sinner contributing nothing to his own salvation can all the glory go to God. Reformation thinking therefore had this as its guiding light for all theology. Does the theology lead someone to say, to God alone be the glory? Or does man retain some of the glory for himself? The reformers saw that true doctrine credits all glory to God. And that starts with the true gospel. Listen, salvation isn't fire insurance. Salvation is God calling to himself a people for his own possession to honor him and bring him glory and upon whom he can pour out all of his goodness and all of his grace for all of eternity. Turn right back to Ephesians chapter 1. 
verse 11. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Why? So that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. For his glory. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It's all about God's glory. And how is God glorified in Ephesians chapter 1? By the salvation of sinners through Jesus Christ. Question number one of the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end or chief purpose of man? Answer, the chief end or purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And there it is. There's the gospel. You see, soli deo gloria doesn't mean God gets all the glory and you get nothing. That would be fair. That, that would be right. But God isn't fair. He's actually very, very unfair in your favor. Because through Christ, he gets glorified and we enjoy him forever. God's glory and your joy, God's holiness and your sinfulness, how are they brought together? They're brought together when God destroys all that is wicked and evil, puts his justice on display by executing wrath on sin, and he does it by offering himself as the object of that wrath. He suffers in our place. He hangs on a tree, bleeding and dying so that guilty sinners like you and I can find mercy and pardon and be made right with him. Let me close with one last quote from Martin Luther. I think this is there in your bulletin. When the devil throws our sins up to us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean that I shall be sentenced to eternal damnation? By no means. For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Where he is, there I shall be also. These Reformation truths, these, these five solas, don't just preserve a movement in church history. They preserve the gospel, which is the instrument for God to be eternally glorified and for you to be eternally blessed. So let's, let's cling to these truths as we cling to Christ and to the gospel so that God gets all the glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your providence. That you have used men and women throughout history to teach truth and preserve truth and preserve the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for those who, who labored and suffered to confront error and to proclaim the truth. And we ask you, Lord, that by your Spirit in this church, you would keep us from wandering into doctrinal error. We love the gospel, Lord. It's, a, it's our only hope. It's our only hope for peace with you in this life and eternal blessing in the next life. And so, Lord God, we pray through your word, through the power of your spirit, you would settle these truths into our hearts. Help us to cling to them and help us to live them out in such a way that you receive all the glory. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God's word says that you have been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Now go believing that truth and bringing all glory to God. Amen.